good evening. Can I welcome you uh, to our evening broadcast from St. Faith Baptist Church. We do thank you for joining with us this evening. We trust indeed that you're keeping well and that you're keeping safe in these days. Again, trust indeed that you're enjoying the good weather. It does indeed, I think, help in these days of lockdown and isolation. But again, please be wise and follow the government guidelines in these days. We have a guest speaker this evening again, Pastor John Taylor, who spoke to us this morning. Again, we'll be bringing God's word this evening. We trust indeed that you were blessed by his ministry this morning. And again, that you'll be challenged again as he brings God's word this evening. Let's just pray together and look to the Lord for his help this evening. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we come into your presence again this evening, Lord, we do thank you for your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you again for his finished work of the cross, Lord. We thank you for the precious blood that was shed, Lord, and for the price that he paid, Lord. The one who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Lord, so we thank you for those that are saved, Lord, that we are accepted in him, Lord. It's just as if I'd never sinned, Lord. When you, when you look at us this evening, Lord, you don't see our sin, but you see the righteousness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, and in days of so much uncertainty, Lord, we thank you again for the certainty of the gospel, Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you indeed that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the simplicity of the gospel. It is a call of faith this evening, but we do indeed thank you for the assurance that it brings that indeed that we have that shall be saved, Lord. There's no doubt about it, Lord, and we thank you again, Lord, for the eternal security of the gospel, Lord. We thank you that once we're saved, we're saved for time and for eternity. And so we pray again this evening, Lord, as the good news of the gospel will be sounded out, that it may come as a blessing to your people, but indeed it may come to a challenge to any who would listen in uh, this evening that are not saved, Lord. We thank you again, Lord, that, uh, for the scope of the gospel, Lord, and that it, indeed it is for the whole world. Your word again reminds that look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else lord and so we thank you lord that whether someone's listening in in same field this morning lord or whether they're listening in from the united states or anywhere around the world this evening lord we thank you it's the same gospel and the same savior who can save them this evening and so we do pray lord that we thank you lord although we cannot meet in a church building that you're not limited by a church building that you can work in each of our homes this evening and so we do pray lord again as your word would be preached lord again that might find fall on good the good seed of the word might fall on good ground and that we might see fruit this evening following the preaching of the gospel lord so we pray for you the message that will go forward lord help us lord not to be distracted lord even in our own homes that we might just give that time of attention to it lord and listen to what you would have to say to us this evening lord again we pray for all the needs of the fellowship lord you know all the specific needs uh, this evening lord you know those who are maybe little downcast lord finding the isolation difficult we pray even you might encourage them through your word this evening lord we pray for any lord who are uh, particularly unwell at the minute lord maybe some in hospital lord some feeling particularly poorly at home lord whatever the situation might be lord we pray for them indeed you might touch them and raise them up and help the doctors who care for them we continue to pray particularly for those that are affected by coronavirus lord and again we thank you for the improvement and those in the fellowship that have been infected lord and we pray again that you may continue to to raise them up to full health and strength again again we continue to pray particularly for those that work in our nhs lord in the front line dealing uh, with this terrible disease lord and we do indeed pray for them you'll keep them safe lord and you'll give them the help that they need in these days so lord we do look to you for the continuing work of the fellowship lord whilst we acknowledge that we cannot meet in a church building lord we do continue to further the work lord and so we pray for it in these days lord particularly pray for the pastor all his responsibility lord and particularly preparing your word week by week lord we pray indeed you might meet with him in the quiet place bless him and rachel and the family undertake for them in these days we pray so lord for this little time that we'll spend together we pray indeed you might be pleased to bless us in the Lord Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. As already said, we do thank you for tuning in this evening. And again, we trust indeed you've been blessed. We thank Pastor Taylor uh, for coming along and uh, giving us our message again this evening. We trust his blessing upon God's word as he preaches that uh, this evening. Just one or two other things to bring 
uh, before you this evening on Wednesday night. We have a little change in format to our Wednesday evening meeting. On the first Wednesday of the month, we're planning to give a missionary update. And this Wednesday night, we will have a report from Every Home Crusade. They're doing a great work um, up in Canalan, uh, printing literature and distributing it all over the world. And so they're going to be giving us a report on Wednesday night, giving us an update on that. They were due to be with us at our missionary weekend. At the end of March, weren't able to be along with us. So it's good to give them the opportunity to give us that report this Wednesday night coming. And we hope to continue that on the first Wednesday night of each month. And that's at 8 p.m. on Wednesday night. And then next Lord's Day, uh, Pastor Moffat will be speaking uh, as usual. And he'll be speaking in the morning at 11.30 and the evening at 6 30 so please continue to pray for him pray for the preparation and please join with us next sunday as well so now i just would like to hand over uh, to pastor taylor well already this morning we have been looking at the book of psalms and we looked at psalm 1 which i said helps us in maintaining our walk with god in difficult times remember that as christians the word of god must be preeminent in our lives The walk of the Christian must be different from the world and the witness of the Christian must impact the lives of others. But it's great to be back again tonight and to have the opportunity to share the word of God with you again. And I want to thank you for that invitation and pray that God will bless our time together tonight. Now I want to turn our thoughts just now to the book of Psalms again and we're turning to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and I want to read to you from verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin. Did my mother conceive me? Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading from his word. Let's just bow for a moment and pray for God's help. Father, again, it's our privilege to come once more to the word of God today. And we thank you for the opportunity to read your word publicly. And now we thank you for the opportunity just to meditate upon it, to learn lessons, our Father, from this lovely psalm 
that would in some way help each one of us to consider our ongoing relationship with you. So, Father, grant to us, we pray, the help of the Holy Spirit and grant that you will speak through your word to all our hearts and use it, we pray, for our good and for your glory. And we ask it all in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen. This psalm that I have read to you tonight is one of seven psalms that are referred to as the penitential psalms. And all of them are ascribed to God's servant David. Now of all the kings that served in Israel, there was none like King David, and his life is like a rags to riches story. Remember he was taken from a very poor family as a mere shepherd boy, And in the land of Israel, God made him Israel's greatest and most influential king. He was a man described as a man after God's own heart. And yet, like us, his journey was not without its difficulties. It wasn't without its discouragements and temptations. The scriptures say this about David In 1 Kings 15 and verse 5, David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. You see, David was a great man and David was a godly man. He was a great leader and he was a man after God's own heart. But even great men have their blemishes. And even great men yield to temptation and sadly fall into sin. And David was no exception. In fact, this whole matter regarding Uriah the Hittite was a great tragedy in what was otherwise a blameless life. Now, if you want to read more of this particular story and the background to it, then you can look at David's fall into sin when you go home tonight as you read the story in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And those chapters are very important because we're told in 2 Samuel 11, it ends with these words, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. The thing that David did displeased the Lord. And so tonight, as I bring you here to Psalm 51, I want you to look with me at what I'm calling the confession of a broken heart. One of the greatest difficulties in reaching men and women today with the gospel of God's grace is that they don't understand what they are in the sight of God. They don't seem to understand that sin is a horrible thing, that it offends God, and that they are sinners in the sight of a thrice holy God. Generally speaking, people do not see themselves as sinners. Now, they will confess that they are not perfect. They will say that although they sin before God at times, they don't mean it. And so therefore they see no need for God's salvation. Well, this psalm sees David facing up to his true state. And it shows us how David was dealing with what we can only describe as the horror of his sin. And if any chapter in the Bible reveals the high cost of sinning, then it is this one, because David was a man after God's own heart, but he was still a sinner. And David only failed in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, but what a great failure it was, and what a great price this man had to pay. You see, David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He ended up being guilty of the murder of her husband Uriah, and at that stage in his life, things were in a terrible mess. But you know, no matter what kind of a mess we make of our lives, God is a God who is waiting and willing and ready to forgive. Because you see here that when David 
repented of that sin that he had committed, that that repentance led him back again into a relationship with his God. And what we can learn from this psalm about David are things that you and I need to know about ourselves because here we see the confession of a broken heart. As you and I think about David's experience here, the first thing I want you to note with me is David's concern for his sin. There's no doubt that Psalm 51 records for us a very personal and a very moving story. It brings to us the picture of a man who was obviously brokenhearted because of his awful deeds, but it also shows to us a man who was not only honest with himself, but a man who was honest with God. And he sought to make amends, and he sought to put matters right in his own life between him and God. And as you and I look at David tonight, it helps us to see ourselves in the light of God's word. It helps us to see our own sin. It helps us to see how we ought to approach God with regards to the problem of sin in our lives. As David honestly assesses his own life, first of all, there's an acknowledgement of original sin. You see, David had committed adultery and he had fallen into sin, but he realized that the problem of sin in his life was a problem that existed long before he had ever set eyes on the beautiful Bathsheba. Look at what he says here in verse 5. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David knows that not only had he sinned with Bathsheba, but he knows that from birth he had a sinful nature. The real problem was not just adultery in a moment of weakness, The fact is that David was a sinner by birth and that sin had polluted every area of this man's life. In other words, his experience was not simply a one-off failure. It was an ongoing problem. He was aware of his sinful state and he knew that if God didn't deal with him in mercy, then David had no hope. He even goes back to his childhood even to his actual birth into the world. And this is what he says. He says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he's not trying to implicate his mother in what he had done. He's not blaming his mother for his condition as if he was shifting the blame onto somebody else. What David is simply telling us is this, that original sin is a reality. And that natural depravity is something that marks the lives of each one of us who are listening to the word of God. You must remember that as far as David was concerned personally, he had been brought up in a good home. He had an upright mother and a godly father who believed in the true God of Israel. He's not trying to blame his parents for the condition of his own heart and life. He's simply facing the facts. He's acknowledging that he's a fallen creature, that he was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, and the problem, the real problem, was not just the sin of his adultery with Bathsheba. His whole life was polluted with sin. You know, that's not just true of David. That's true of the whole of humanity. The word of God makes that abundantly clear to us whenever Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome in that great treatise concerning the gospel. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. It doesn't matter really about the kind of family we've been brought up in. It doesn't matter tonight whether we're rich or poor, whether we're religious or not. The fact is that we all bear the marks of the fall in the Garden of Eden. We are all sinners at our very best. Here's what the apostle again says to the Christians at Rome. Romans 5 verse 12. Wherefore, 
As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Friends, tonight that might be difficult for us to accept, but it's true. It's a biblical picture. You and I have sinned in Adam. Our sin is an offense to a thrice holy God. That sin mars our fellowship with him, and unless and until That sin is forgiven and cleansed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You and I cannot have fellowship with a living God. Charles Spurgeon interestingly says this. He's often referred to as the prince of preachers, but this is what he says. The fountain of our lives is polluted as well as the streams. What Spurgeon is simply reminding us of is this. Every area of your life and mine tonight, it's affected by and it's tainted with sin. You see, it's not a matter of feeling God at one point. It's not a matter of being too bad or having just a bit of religion. It's a matter of being honest. It's a matter of being honest with ourselves. It's a matter of being honest before God and acknowledging tonight what we really are in his sight and accepting this fact, difficult though it might be, that you and I are vile and sinful creatures in the sight of God. Such is our sin and such is the enormity of it that you and I deserve to be punished for that sin. We deserve to be condemned to a Christless hell for all eternity. Now, I know that might not seem popular in today's world where almost everybody doesn't do anybody any harm. But the fact is that we are sinners in the sight of God. And if we cannot see that and we can't understand that, then we're missing the point. The real problem with me and with you, the real problem with our society today is this. We are living in a sinful, fallen world where sin abounds on every hand. Men and women at their very best, and the very best of men and women are sinners in the sight of God, and they have no thought of God in their souls. Listen, folks, that is something that you and I need to be honest about. We're born in sin, every single one of us, with a natural bias towards sin. That's why we have no thought of things spiritual. We're slaves to our sin, and that's why so many people cannot break the habits of their sinful living. They give up something for a little time, but ultimately they return to it again, Because they don't know the joy of having their sins forgiven and the chains that bind them to that sin broken by the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you tonight is simply this, that the real problem in our society today is the problem of the human heart. Because the Bible says that our hearts are deceitful and they're desperately wicked and so bad that you and I don't even know it. Would you be prepared to accept that tonight? Because if you do, that's a good building block for you and I to move on with. All of us sinners in the sight of God, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. He knew it, but that wasn't the real problem. It was just a sin of many other sins because this man, like you and me, had been born in sin. Firstly, there's an acknowledgement of original sin. Secondly, there is an acknowledgement of personal sin. David doesn't make any excuses whatsoever about his sin. He doesn't use his mother. He doesn't use his upbringing. He doesn't use the world. He says this in verse 3 and 4. For I acknowledge my transgression." And my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Three times David makes this very personal. He holds his hands up to God. 
And he says, Lord, I have done that. My sin is ever before me. I've sinned against you. I acknowledge my transgressions. That's what I would call real honesty. And you wouldn't expect anything less from God's servant David. He looks carefully at his own heart. He looks carefully at himself. And he seeks to come to terms with what he had done. He knows that his sin has affected others. But the real problem is the sin in his own life. He knew what he had done was wrong. He couldn't get that sin out of his mind. So many others had been affected by it. He knew it was a problem. But the important thing is he knew it was a personal problem. And it had to be dealt with in a personal way. And the only way it could be dealt with was between him and his God. You see, it's one thing to talk about the sin of our society and some of the things we see are horrendous. It's another thing to sit in a church building or to sit in somebody's home and look at a Christian and a non-Christian and point your finger and talk about the sin in their lives. But it's a different thing altogether for you and I to acknowledge our own sin. And yet if we're going to know God's forgiveness, if we're going to have our sins removed, you and I need to look deep within our own hearts and our own souls. And we must deal with the problem of our sin because it separates us from God. It controls the way we live. It will one day keep us out of God's heaven if it is not confessed and dealt with. David confessed his sin. He acknowledged what he was. He knew what he had did. And he understood that this was a personal thing and it needed to be put right. Can you see that as you look at your own heart? Are you prepared to accept that this is something that you need to deal with between you and God alone? Oh yes, others might have been affected by the sin that you committed, but the sin itself is yours, just as my sin was mine. And you need to deal with it, therefore, in a personal way. That's what David did. And his honesty before God brought great dividends in his life. A well-known newspaper's editorial led one day with a question in large print. It simply said, what on earth is wrong with today's world? Someone wrote back and said, I am. Folks, we all are because we're guilty sinners in the sight of God. I see here David's concern for his sin. The second thing I want you to note here is David's cleansing from his sin. Because having come to terms with the problem and realizing that he was a great sinner in the sight of God and that he had a great personal need, David turned to God and he sought God's forgiveness. He didn't want to die with this cloud hanging over him. He wanted to be cleansed. He wanted to be restored. He wanted to enjoy fellowship with God once more. He hungered for God and for the forgiveness of God. And you will note in this psalm that David therefore takes steps in order to put this matter right between God and himself. Let me just note three things quickly. Note firstly here is appeal to God. Verse 7 Through to 11. David says purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. And blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit, from me. You see, David not only showed how honest he was about his sin, 
David realized that the answer to his problem did not lie with him. It lay with God. Because no matter what he did, he could not alter the state that he found himself in. He could not change the condition of his life and his heart. He knew that he needed outside help. And he simply throws himself on the mercy of God. And he seeks cleansing for his sin. Three times you'll notice David pleads with God. He says, have mercy. Have mercy. David knew that God could forgive him. He knew that God could cleanse him. Even though his sins were many, God would forgive him and wash him whiter than the snow. David knew that a holy God demanded purity of life. And the only way that David could be pure and be found righteous in the sight of God was for him to have his sins all washed away so that he might be justified in the sight of God. It's exactly the same for you and me. We're sinners in the sight of God. We've already established that. But you and I need our sins forgiven. And the good news of the gospel is this, that God is waiting and he's willing to forgive us for all our sins. And I mean every last one of them. But we need to do a very difficult thing in our own minds. We need to admit that we're sinners. And we need to come with our sin and our shame. And we need to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. Because sin has left us filthy and dirty. But yet all of that filth and all of that dirt and all of that sin can be washed whiter than the snow. And it can happen because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one whom God sent into the world to be our Savior. He's the one who died on the cross for sinners, just like us. He loved us, the Bible says. He gave himself for us. He gave up his own life unto death. He poured out his soul unto death. And he shed his own precious blood that you and I might have our sins forgiven. Ah, you say to me, but hold on a moment, Pastor. I'm sitting here, my head's down. I feel terrible. My sin is great. I've made a mess of my life. I've done things like David did. And on and on you go with the problem. Listen, my friend, there is a remedy to your problem. It doesn't matter how deep down in sin you might be. It doesn't matter about the skeletons you've buried in your cupboard. It doesn't matter about the things that you've left behind in your wake. Listen, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Doesn't matter how many of them. Doesn't matter the amount of them or the depth of them. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, It cleanses us from all sin. The hymn writer says this from experience. On the golden streets of heaven, all men hope to walk someday. Yet so many are not willing to accept the living way. But while others build on good works or opinions if they may, hallelujah, hallelujah, I'm depending on the blood. That's all I'm depending on. Because nothing but the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can cleanse us from our sin. There's nothing we can do that can ever make atonement for our souls. And when we realize that, we will come and we will throw ourselves on the mercy of God and seek his forgiveness. And we know with confidence with biblical authority, that God will forgive us on account of Christ and the blood of Christ will cleanse us from our sin. One night, John Wesley Wesley was returning home from a meeting. He was confronted by a masked man and this thief asked him for all that Wesley had. But Wesley had very little money and just some gospel literature in his possession. In frustration, the man turned and he ran away but as he ran away from Wesley Wesley shouted at him and he said to him young man 
I fear that you will live to regret this sort of life. Remember that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Years later, Wesley was leaving another meeting and he was approached by a stranger that he'd never met. This man was now a very successful businessman and he was also a Christian and he said this, Mr. Wesley, I am the man who sought to rob you a number of years ago and I remember what you shouted at me and I want to tell you that I owe you everything. You owe me nothing at all, said Wesley. You owe it all to the precious blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We see his appeal to God. Secondly, we see his attitude toward God. Verse 12, David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I'll say it again. If there's any chapter in the Bible which reveals the high cost of sinning, it is this one. David's whole being was affected by what he did. It affected his eyes, verse 3. It affected his mind, verse 6. It affected his ears, verse 8. It affected his heart and it affected his spirit, verse 10. It affected his mouth, verse 13 to 15. You see, what David had done affected every area of his being because there is a high cost to sinning and the consequences are always great. David was out of fellowship and he knew it. And he wanted more than anything else that that fellowship with God would be restored. You see, David had lost the sense of God's presence. He lost his peace of heart. He had lost the joy of walking with his God. And David longed for restoration and that his life might change. I may be speaking tonight to the backslidden Christian listening to my voice. And like David tonight, you are walking afar off from the Lord at this present time. You've lost your sense of God's nearness. You've lost the sense of joy and peace that used to be your portion in life. And as a result of that, you're not nearly as enthusiastic and committed as you used to be when you lived with God and for God. And now your spiritual life, it's no longer real and it's not vibrant. And you find yourself in a place that you're away from God. Friend, tonight I encourage you Come back and be restored. Do what David did. Acknowledge your sin that took you away from God. Come back and cast yourself upon his mercy and ask for God to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to restore you that you might enjoy fellowship with him once more. As you are, you'll never be really happy. Until you're restored, you'll never be really useful. Wouldn't it be great tonight if you, just like David, would come and sort this matter out with God? It's personal. It's between you and him. And that you might say tonight and mean it from the depth of your soul, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. We see his appeal to God, his attitude toward God, and thirdly, his action before God, very quickly, verse 15. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it, and delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. David was serious about all of this. He knew so too was God. God demanded of him a broken and a contrite heart. God demanded that David's repentance was genuine, that David was actually sorry for his sin. God didn't want crocodile tears from this man. God wanted to see David sorrow over his sin with a humble heart that acknowledged its need of God. That's what God asks of you and me tonight too. 
If we really want to be done with sin, if we want to enjoy fellowship with God, if we want to know our sins forgiven, he wants us to repent of that sin and to leave it. He wants us to be sorry about our sin. Not sorry that we're caught out doing something that is wrong, but genuinely sorry that we have sinned against God. Are you at the place just now where you would say with the hymn writer, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No, could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. And David knew that. And he came openly and honestly to God and he dealt with the matter in God's presence. And God restored fellowship with this man. Did you and I come the same way tonight? First of all, be honest about our sin, that this is a personal matter between us and God and that we would come and throw ourselves upon his mercy. Would you and I be honest enough to come and reveal our sin to God, although he knows about it? Would we repent of it and tell God that we're sorry so that you and I can know cleansing and forgiveness through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Friend, if you forget everything I've said tonight, remember this. If you repent of your sin and you leave it, God will forgive you. He will pardon you. He will cleanse you. And he will restore you to fellowship with himself. All he wants from you is what he got from David. And that is the confession of a broken heart. Why not come to Christ tonight? Have your sins forgiven and your life transformed and know what it is to walk with God. Let's just pray together as we close. Our God and Father, we thank you so much for the gospel of your grace. We thank you that we can get a look into David's life tonight from this beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. And see there a man who was concerned about his personal need and willing to confess his sin that he might be restored to fellowship with God. Father, it's not always easy to acknowledge that we're sinners in your sight. But we thank you that if we do that and come and throw ourselves upon your mercy and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So bless your word to us, we pray tonight, and help each one of us just to look carefully and clinically at our own personal lives. If we're not saved, our Father, save us. And if we have strayed, restore us the joy of our salvation. Bless your word, our Father, throughout this day that has gone forth in so many places. Bless the witness of this local church in days to come. And may it be, our Father, that it will please you to use the word of God going out far and near to bring people to yourself, to build your people, and to bring glory to your thrice holy name. And we ask it all for the sake and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.